the young folks, the children, if you will, follow Miss Hannah uh, back for Children's Church. And always gets the good crowd, eh? <laughs> All right. Man, it's great to see everybody this morning. Uh, if you're a guest here today uh, of someone, family member, whatever, I want you to know uh, you made our day. And uh, the fact that you're willing to come and spend your time with us makes a, a big deal. It's a big deal to us, and I want you to know that this morning. If you will, take your Bibles, turn to Second Chronicles chapter number 7. Second Chronicles chapter number 7, we're going to continue on with a verse that we dealt with last week. Uh, actually, we've dealt with it the last two weeks. Um, you say, well, why are you not sharing something about Mother's and Mother's Day? I'll promise you, if we can get revival in our homes and in our church, it'll help mamas. Amen? 
And it might even help a few daddies. I don't know. It is, that remains to be seen. <laughs> All right. All right, if you find your place in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, uh, let me know that by standing to your feet this morning. If you're able, if you're not, do not worry about it, all right? 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Most of you should be able to quote this this morning. It says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. And will forgive their sin and heal their land. Let's all read that together this morning. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Brother Bill, if you will, pray for us this morning. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Uh, we talked last week and began a series on the pattern for revival. And we, we started off by describing a situation of, and I remember my mother making a dress, how that she would lay the pattern out and cut out the pattern. And that pattern would work for multiple dresses. If you didn't have to wad the pattern up, throw it away after the first one. It was something that worked every time. And the writer of Second Chronicles here, God is speaking to him, uh, trying to get across to him to, to relay to the people, hey, if you want your land healed, if you want revival to take place, this is the pattern that, it will, that will work. And the wonderful thing about it is, it worked way back then in the Old Testament. It worked in the New Testament. Guess what? It will work today. Amen, church? The pattern will still work. And, and I was thinking this morning as I was sitting on the couch drinking my coffee and, and going back over everything, uh, uh, that I didn't have to do a whole lot of studying for this. I'll just be honest with you. I almost feel like I need to give you half your money back today. But I won't, okay? I'm just joking on that one. Uh, there's not a lot of studying to this. It says what it means, and guess what? It means what it says. And so we can look at the pattern that God has given us for revival, and let's break it down. Last week, we shared you the first three. I'll recap those because I look around the room, and I'm excited about this day. Some people here this week wasn't here last week, so I'll share that with you. The first thing that we see is the person of revival, the person of revival. It says, if my people, which are called by my name. Now, who is that? That's you and I today, Correct. That's a person that has asked Christ to come into their life, to change their life, be Lord and Savior of their life. Now they are a Christian. That's where revival will start. It will always start with God's people. Sometimes we pray for revival. We want sinners saved. We want people's lives changed. Well, they're out doing what they do. Sinners do what sinners do. And sinners are good at sinning. Can I get a witness? That's what they do. The problem is it always starts with the Christian and God will bring revival in a Christian's life so that it affects the sinners. We, we read and we talked last week about uh, Jacob and his life. We, we see he was revived. But what had to take place in Jacob's life? First of all, Jacob had to be alive. Isn't that simple? I mean, that is just the basics of it. In order to be revived, you've got to be alive to start with. And the Bible talks about how the, when they told him the words of Jacob, it said he revived. What happened? Ja jo uh, Jacob heard a message that delivered hope. And that message of hope was that Joseph is alive. Joseph is Lord of all things. And Joseph sent the wagons to bring you to him. He gave you everything that you need. That message renewed Jacob's life. And what did that renewal do in his life? It made him stand out. You can imagine, I talked about last week, as Jacob, an old man, way up in his year, began to dance around his tent going, I'm going to see Joseph. I'm going to see Joseph. Pack your stuff. We're taking off. It made a difference in Jacob's life. 
when you and I as a Christian, when real revival breaks out in our life, people will look at you funny. You ever had anybody look at you funny? Lately? All right. Some of you say, yeah, pretty much on a daily basis. Revival in your life will make you stand out in a crowd. Andrew was telling me, and I mentioned this last week, I think, that Gracie was talking about praying in school. She said, kids will think I'm weird. You know what her school needs? Some weird kids that will pray for their classmates. I've almost got to the point where I don't want my kids to tell me what's going on at school because it's like, huh, really? I feel broken hearted sending them into it. But it'll make them different. Oh, if we want to see revival in our land, we're going to have to be different. Secondly, we saw the posture of revival. It says, shall humble themselves. Humble. What does that word mean? I didn't give you all this last week, but I, I looked it up. It says, having or showing a modest or low estimate of one's importance. Importance. Sometimes somebody will degrade themselves. Oh, I'm just a poor, rotten, low down, sorry, no good for nothing, lowering a snake's belly in a wagon track, scoundrel. I'm not. And what are they doing? They're tearing themselves down. That's not humility. Humility is simply knowing who you are, which is a great and wonderful thing, a, a saved person that God has forgiving all of those things. But you have now placed him in importance. You know his rightful place and your rightful place. You see, a lot of people want to make God important in their life. They want to make him prominent in their life, but he has to be preeminent in our life. Humbleness means putting God in his rightful place and you in yours. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 23, verse 12, Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. James 4.10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. 1 Peter uh, 5, 6 says, Humble yourself, therefore, unto the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. You know what the world says? Beat on your own chest. Blow your own ego up. Promote yourself. And that's when you'll get what you want. God's economy says, if you'll put me in your rightful place, in the rightful place, if you'll humble yourself before me, I'll promote you. How many of you would rather be promoted by God than the world? <laughs> Any day of the week, twice on Sunday. Amen? Humble yourself. The posture of revival. Then thirdly, we see the prayer for revival. Again, this is simple, y'all. And pray... And seek my face. Sometimes we'll skip over that seek my face, but that's probably the most important words in here. I used the illustration last week that when I am talking to someone and it's about a serious situation, I want to see their eyeballs. My daddy, he says, look them eyeball to eyeball. That's when so you know it's serious. And sometimes when your children are little and you want to get their attention and they're, they got ADD or uh, ABC or whatever and they're just, uh, and you have to grab them cheek, cheek. Say, look, I'm trying to talk to you. Sometimes God has to cheek to cheek. Say, look, I'm trying to get your attention. The, the prayer for revival is just not just pray, but God, I want your attention. I want what you want. The Bible says in these verses, and this is the important part, 1 John 5, 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Again, that goes back to the personal revival. You have to know Him. And this confidence that we have in, in Him, that if we ask anything, here's the key, according to what? His will. He heareth us. And if we know that He heareth us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desire of Him. What does that mean? 
You ask in His will, He says, whatever you want. Whatever you ask. Why do we not have revival today? We ain't been asking for it in His will. Does the Bible teach us that He said, I'm not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance? It's His will. We're not asking for it. In John chapter 15, verse 7 and 8, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, it shall be done unto you. Herein, or because, is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. What's the product of praying for revival? Lord, I'm asking your will be done. Lord, I'm asking for people to be saved. I'm asking for lives to be changed. I'm asking for homes to be put back together. I'm asking for people that are broken to be put back together. Lord, I'm asking in your will that this be done. I know there's a group out there that says name it, claim it, and they go, but they're not asking according to God's will. But that is according to God's will. And he says, if you'll ask that, and it will glorify my Father in what you're asking, you will be fruitful in what you're asking. You will be my disciple. What is revival? Revival's not hanging from the chandeliers. I don't think none of us can hang from these things. Revival is not a hoop and a holler. Revival is changing our hearts and changing our eyes and mind toward others. Boy, if we want to pray and see that, it will be according to God's will with His attention and His purpose front and foremost. But here's the new part today that you hadn't heard yet. Some of you have heard that before. The pivot of revival. The pivot of revival. That's an odd word to throw in a message, ain't it? The pivot of revival. It said, and turn from their wicked ways. I was thinking about that this morning. You said, well, God, you're asking us to pray. You're asking us to, to, to be forgiven from our sins. Isn't that similar to the same thing? But he said, turn from your wicked ways. We're living in a world today that... Uh, it's almost wicked ways everywhere you turn. Would you agree with me this morning? I mean, it's like, my goodness, what else can they come up with that's vile and vicious? And so it's important as a Christian today that we be willing to turn from those things. In other words, there is a, 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 the two words came to mind this morning, discernment and determination. The world would, would try to tell you that there's some things well it's okay to let this bleed into your life you can handle this much of it you know it ain't that big of a deal you know I ain't nobody told me nothing so if I'm about to get on your toes that's between you and God okay a little drink down there won't hurt nothing turn from your wicked ways pivot Watching that ain't that big a deal. You can't hardly watch nothing on TV nowadays, can you? This, that's not that bad of a joke. That's not that big of a deal. Discernment. Have you ever been about to do something the Holy Spirit goes, I, I mean, it's such, the you know, Holy Spirit can't even verbalize a word. You ever had your mom and daddy say that? I, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Don't do that. That's discernment. You know better. Now you have to deter have the determination to turn away from it. Turn from their wicked ways. Let me read some verses for you. Are we having fun yet? It says, Proverbs 25, 26, A righteous man falleth down before the wicked is as a troubled fountain and a corrupt spring. Let me read that again. A righteous man falling down before the wicked. In other words, a Christian that is dabbling in some of this nonsense is as a troubled fountain or a corrupt spring. There's three things you have to have in life. Air, water, and food. You can last about a minute, I believe. Some people maybe longer without air. 
you can last about a day or two without water. And uh, some of us can last a real long time without food, okay? <laughs> We're not going to get into that part, all right? But you got to have water. And the very fact that the verse says that a person that is a Christian that professes Christ as their personal Savior, but yet dabbles in this wickedness in their life, is like bad water. I used to love, when I was a kid, I loved Westerns and Frontiers and all that stuff. And, and I read a lot of books on Westerns. And when those folks would take off out across the prairie to get to wherever they were going, one of the most important things that they would look for is where's all the springs, where's all the water holes. And the second big most important thing was, is it any good? Has it got sulfur in it? And that was important. Can you imagine being in a situation where you have to have a drink of water? You want something to drink so bad, and you taste it, and it is the foulest, nastiest thing. Oh. That's what a Christian is like that won't turn from their wicked ways. Is the picture clear for you? It goes on in Acts Acts chapter 3, verse 17. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all the prophets, that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. And repent ye therefore, be converted that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Turn from our wicked ways. I was thinking about this this morning. Probably one of the most uh, unique abilities or the, one of the most important attributes of a person hear me out on this I ain't weird okay is the ability to pivot did y'all know that that's a very important characteristic to have I grew up I love to play sports I love to play football and uh, the things that uh, I learned early on it's going to shock some of y'all, but they always put me up as a lineman. I never got to be receiver, running back, none of that stuff. I don't know why. Don't know why. Some of y'all know. Okay. But <laughs> it was important when they would teach us to be linemen. One of the most important things, and, and uh, Kevin will back me up, was the ability to pivot. Pass blocking. When we'd run in blockage, we'd have to fire off get our head across, and pivot our hips so we can seal it off. Brother Dave would probably be able to tell you today, but one of the most important aspects of a hitter in baseball is it ain't about the arms. It's about the hips. Am I right? I ain't going to do that again. That's probably traumatic for some of y'all. <laughs> but the ability to pivot your hips through and swing, that's where the power comes from to hit a baseball. In tennis, I don't know nothing about tennis, but I know about hitting a tennis ball. You got to be able to pivot, hit. In sports, athletics, things like that, even in carpentry, it ain't all about the arms. It's about being able to move and, and do all things. It's important. In your work life, your career, my sister, Tina, is a nurse. She uh, has done everything in nursing, it seems like. She's been in the, the delivery, whatever that part is, neonatal care. Uh, she has been spent a lot of time in uh, hospice, and she just changed jobs. She changes jobs quicker than you. I mean, and they come looking for her. I mean, they, she don't have to hunt a job. They come finding her. And so this particular job she got, I asked her yesterday, I said, how's it going? She said, I'm having to learn all kinds of new systems. What am I saying? Tina's having to pivot in her career. How many of you ever done that? You've only worked one job. Even on the job, they say, I need you to do this. And if you can't do it, what do they do? They find somebody that can. You've got to be able to pivot. The Bible says, turn from your wicked ways. The recipe for revival is to be able to pivot in your Christian walk. When you are walking this way, knowing this is God's will, something becomes a difficulty in your life. you be able to turn away from those things. Discernment, the Holy Spirit will give it in your life. Discernment is important. But here's what you got to do. You got to listen to the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you this morning. 
Are you listening when God speaks? Are you listening when the Holy Spirit says, "Uh uh-uh, don't don't go down that path, go down this one. Don't do that, do this. That's the recipe for revival. Then fifthly, the product for revival. This is the good part, y'all. I told you last week, we're going to get to the good part, all right? When you do all this, and this verse is a principle in God's Word. And now the Bible is full of principles. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's a principle. Uh, there's, uh, they're all leaving me right now, but there's a lot of verses I memorized that are principles. You do a set of things, a set of rules or, or conditions, and I will do this. Well, we see the product of revival. In, ver- in uh, the latter part of the verse, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. That's the conditions and principles that God laid out. He said, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins. What is wonderful about forgiving sins? The Bible says in Psalms 32, 1, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. You may have a bad day, it may not all go your way, but if you're a Christian today, you've had a blessed day. Why? Because your sins have been forgiven, your transgressions have been covered by the blood of Christ. You know what? A lot of people look at me and they see a, an individual that may have messed up in life and see a person that ain't necessarily got all, everything together. I mean, my English is bad. I'm saying the word ain't, okay? I don't have sense enough to get in out of the rain half the time. But when God looks at me, he sees a righteous person. Why? I'm righteous because Jesus' blood covered me. I'm a blessed man today. I remember when we were in Mexico and I'd be preaching and Brother Lanny would be interpreting for me and I would say something about being blessed and he would say it and the whole crowd would crack up laughing. I'd move on. I kept preaching and I'd say the word, I'm a blessed person, blah, blah, blah. And he had interpreted it, and they'd all start laughing again. I'm like, finally, I stopped preaching. I said, what are you saying? Because you ain't saying what I'm saying, because what I'm saying is not funny. He said, well, when I interpret blessed man in, in Spanish, it means well fed. <laughs> I'm a blessed man, y'all. Why? I'm well fed, but also my sins have been forgiven. They have been covered. The Bible also says, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is a great picture of God's mercy. A great picture of God's mercy. He said, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive your sins. That means we don't get what we deserve. I heard one preacher said that if I got what I deserved, I'd be in jail, out on bail, or in hell, one or the other. Boy, that's the truth today. I'm thankful that he forgives our sins. We see the product of revival. But then lastly, I want us to see the possibilities of revival. And will heal their land. I'm going to ask a dumb question, all right? How many of you love America? I look around the room and there's some that have served our country with distinction in our military. Y'all fought, y'all served so that we could have the freedom to do this without any possibility of somebody coming through those doors and arresting us or shooting us. Probably many of you have loved ones that have died for this country. I don't know about you, but I want my land healed. Do you today? Absolutely. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. Chances are, based on what little I know about prophecy, what little I know about how things are going, the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of air. Darkness and wickedness in wickedness in dark places, high places. 
I misquoted it. Y'all know the verse. What am I saying? We're battling against a, a, a world that's dominated by Satan. Satan is the ruler and the power of the air. He is the second most powerful being, but God is in control of everything else. But right now, Satan's ruling on this earth. How do I know that? There's actually an argument. An argument over whether or not abortion's right. Really? We have people being killed all around the world today as we meet in here that are killed because they claim to be a Christian. You, how many of you want to move to New York, Chicago, Seattle, anybody? No. Because wickedness is rampant in a lot of those areas. I was talking to a detective this week, asking him about a situation. He said, no, I hadn't had time to deal with that. He said, I've had two murders this week. That's in Walker County, y'all. Chances are, this country's not going to get healed. So what's the Bible talking about? In Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, the Bible says, And said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, keep all of his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. You want to hear the good part? God can heal you, heal those around you in the midst of a perverse generation. What I'm saying is when God brings revival to your house, when God brings revival to Bethany Baptist Church, it will affect those around us. We may not ever see America go back to the way it was back when it first began and the morals that they had, the stance on God that they had, but I promise you it will change those around you. If Bethany Baptist gets revival to take place in this building, it will affect the community around us. It, won't, it can't help but do it. Why? Because when people see fire burning here, they're automatically attracted to it. I think Kathy put something like that in the, in the bulletin this morning. When revival breaks out here, you know what people are going to do? They're going to come to see what happens. Word will get out. We won't even have to tell people. They'll want to come. I remember <laughs> when we were at Temple, we were moving some dirt to be able to add on to the building. And just because we were moving dirt, people was coming to see what we were doing. They were coming to church so that they could find out what we were moving dirt for. We come up with a bright idea. We're just going to hire a dozer and a, and a dump truck and put dirt over here and the next Sunday move it over there and the next Sunday move it over there because we're just going to grow our church by moving dirt. We may try that out here in the field. <laughs> what am I saying? People are curious. If we will follow the pattern of revival, he said, I will heal your land. The Jewish people, the Israelites, got a healing in the midst of Egypt. They got a deliverance in the midst of torment to the Egyptians. That's what God means by healing your land. He may not ever take America back the way it is, but you still have revival right here. How about it today? Do you want revival at Bethany Baptist Church? I do, like nothing else. Matter of fact, I, I'm going to talk to Brother Steve and Brother Travis this week. And I'm going to do something they probably have never had done to them. I'm going to tell them, fellas, I want you to come. I want you to relax. I want you to preach whatever you want to preach. But no, we do not expect you to bring revival to our church. Where is it going to start? Number one, it's going to start right here with me. And then it's going to start through the pews. That's when it will take place. We're going to enjoy Brother Travis. We're going to enjoy Brother Steve. But when Brother Steve packs up his car and leaves on Wednesday night, revival will not leave with him. I'm excited to, to what, what's going to happen after. And during, before, before, during, and after. I'll get in right order here in just a minute. What God's going to do in our church. I am working on formulating my, my plans and trying to get the rest of the year planned out. 
And uh, right after the revival, we, how many of you know that in the, we have the, the army, they're, they're the, uh, I mean, they're, they're an amazing group of, of men and women that serve in the army. We have the Marines, and they just something about Marines, I mean, they're just some of the baddest dudes they are. I mean, we send Marines where nobody else will go. And then there's the special forces. Them guys are the show enough bad dudes. I mean, they'll go places and we don't even know where they're going and no, don't even know what they're doing. Amen? I mean, they're, they're really. Well, we're going to have an army at, at Bethany Baptist Church. This is people that do does everything that we need them to do that make everything happen here. We're going to have the Marines. That's our go and so teams that is willing to go out into the community and share their story and try to win people to the Lord. And then we're going to have our special forces that are willing. Not only are they going to do all those things, but they're going to be the ones that are willing to spend time with that person that got saved, discipling them, teaching them to do the same thing that they just got done to them. That's going to be our special forces. Now, the special forces is going to take extra training and extra time. But I promise you, if we want to see revival, we're going to have all of those. Brother Rodney, we may start the Bethany Navy, too, with your boat. How's that? We'll, we'll go start a, bo- a boat rock ministry. Anybody here fly a plane? Yeah, we ain't going to do no fly for Air Force, all right? But I'm excited. You know what it's going to take? Everybody working together to bring revival. Here's what we're going to do this morning. I know we did last week. We're going to do it again this week. Let's close out with an altar of prayer for those that are able to. If you can, you come down, sit on the front row. Let's all stand.